Today we'll be speaking to some members of various CSOs um, joining us in the studios. And I have Bright Apia, he's an advocate uh, for child's rights and so he's joining me in the studios and also i have kofi asari he's the executive director of africa education watch rice thank you for joining me good morning yeah, how are you doing you. Well, i'm doing fine anyway. all right i'm fine thank you and also good morning to kofi asari i hope yeah. everything is well good morning. Everything is fine. i'm sure you've been following the conversation this morning about the ges saying um that they would not be organizing um you know free extra classes actually for students who are on the free shs and parents have to bear that cost now we played a video earlier back in 2018 where there was an interview with a regional um, you know, PRO and he said that there would be extra classes and GES was going to ensure that would happen and he was asked where these would happen and he said even in the churches. Now yesterday the national PRO says they never made any promise like that uh, that there would be extra classes in churches and all of that and now parents have to bear the cost. What do you have to say about that especially concerning free SHS? Yeah well for me I think that is a, it's purely a communication issue. And, and lack of that policy direction in the implementation of the of the free SHS sure. uh, because clearly uh, there's no indication of a sort that government has intention of organizing extra classes for uh, people who will be at home at the time that the other uh, track will be in school. Yeah. So clearly if there's that communication uh, probably it is, it, is, it is something that sits with the, the Ghana Education Service, which, which communicate a lot in terms of how they are even implementing the policy. Because it is through their own system that gives the initial statement that they will be doing that. Yeah. And if there's, the same system is coming back to say that they never promised that, for me, it's, it's, it shows that there's no any clear policy direction in terms of how they're rolling out. And some of the things also meet them halfway or whilst they are implementing it the issues come up and they want to address them and all that mm. but a policy like this and and how they want to implement it clearly they should have a, a roadmap in terms of how they engage people in the process mm -hmm. and the, the kind of information that they have to put out there because you are dealing with a, a huge stakeholders but especially parents so yeah. if you communicate something to the public about how you want to roll it out know that you are communicating to millions of parent who want to also understand how the system is going to run. Mm -hmm. And if you come back to say that, no, and it took almost a year because you said this last year. Actually, even two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. And you did not say anything about it. Well, they said now they that there's a demand mm -hmm. on that promise, you are, you are saying that you never did that. It's an issue that probably Ghana Education Service must come back to explain properly. But there are a lot of problems um, with the free SHS. I mean, when you speak to uh, party stalwarts of the NPP, they keep touting their achievements with free SHS. We've gotten about 1.2 million children enrolled. Um, previously, before free SHS, there were some 100,000 children who did not get access to education. And so constantly, they are drumming it into our ears that we have at least initiated that. And it's a good thing for everyone. And so instead of focusing on the challenges, we should rather focus on the opportunities granted uh, to all these children who hitherto could not have attended school. If you look at the entire structure, are you satisfied with the free SHS policy and how it's been implemented so far? Well, um, every policy has its own challenges. Um, in social policy management, um, you definitely will have some negative ramifications mm. in introducing especially new policies. Um, on the scale of 1 to 10, mm -hmm. um, I would say the free senior high school has achieved up to six. Six. On the basis that, one, it has succeeded in expanding access okay. to secondary education. Ghana is, Ghana is committed to universal secondary education by virtue of it being a secondary to the Sustainable Development Goals 4. And so by 2030, all children of secondary school going age must be in school. And so that is a giant step towards mm -hmm. us um, achieving uh, the targets under SDG 4. Okay. And so on the access front, um, not only on the access front and also on the equity front, because we have a situation where not only access, but then there is expanded access, especially for people who are marginalized or who are economically deprived, people whom by reason of their geography wouldn't have been able to access secondary education, yeah. but for this new policy. And so that is the extent to which I align myself to the policy. Okay. On the flip side, the quality deficits are huge. Not quality deficits in terms of the existing quality deficits in our secondary education system before the introduction of free high school, but then the additional quality deficits 
mm. that the free and then the more numbers has occasioned the quality of second education. Okay. It's where we think that if a, a, a little bit of meticulous planning had gone on in the rollout of the policy, we could have averted most of the quality deficits and all this ambulance service mm -hmm. approach to policy management where every other week there's a change in the opening date, every other month something changes. Mm -hmm. There seems to be no plan and everything is ambulance service. Yeah. That is where I think that we we, we, we can do um, better. Ma much better. But parents yeah. are complaining. Um, you know, they have a problem with the fact that their awards go to school um, for maybe a month and a half, and then they come back home and stay two months, three months, and now there's no extra classes. They have to find a way to get them stable that, that at home. That's a big challenge because yeah. parents are spending close to um, the to about 2,600 or so that government is paying for each child mm -hmm. under the free senior high school in a year. Yeah. Parents are paying that money um, by virtue of the fact that their children are spending more time at home than in school. But you see, um, in, it, it becomes difficult to make certain critical analysis of the policy in the sense that Ghanaians are noted for their affinity for free things. Mm -hmm. okay, Ghanaians love their free things. And so it makes it difficult for parents to complain and demand accountability. Parents should have gone beyond just complaining and demanded accountability from the Ghana Education Service because the taxpayers' money is being used to implement the policy. It is free, yes. But the policy is free because we are paying more under communication service tax. There's a, there has been some restructuring of the income mm -hmm. tax, enabling parents to pay more, workers to pay more, and all that. And so it is free because we are paying more taxes. And so we need to move, the parents need to move beyond just complaining to demanding policy accountability from the GAS. Now, look, you have to do this well because we are committing so much of our tax CD into this policy. Well, that is where we need to get to. I remember the CSSPS uh, challenge and parents and students thronged the Independence Square. And unfortunately, we had a government official say that, you know, some party, the opposition party was the one that convince all these parents to come and demonstrate to make them look bad. And so if you're saying that parents uh, should demand accountability, if they come out and they are asking for things to be done the right way and there are certain comments like this, obviously I'm sure it would deter them from even wanting to speak out. I don't think that should be an excuse, but let me bring Mr. Pierre in because uh, we've had challenges with feeding. I remember sometime back in 2017 as well, um, you know, CSOs in SADA also complained and they even threatened that you know they would rather want the free SHS to be scrapped instead of having to endure you know uh, late feeding grants and all of that and so the challenges started from day one up until now we, we are thinking that at least something should have been done to curb the issues to a large extent but we keep experiencing more challenges day in day out yeah, well uh, yes we, we envisage the challenges but the most important thing is that government system we deal with the challenges. That is the ultimate. So if if government machinery comes out to say that we are encountering this problem, it is because somebody is doing it. It it communicates something to me that uh, you have you have left the policy space for somebody to do their own thing, and mm. that is you cannot come back to blame them. If if you have created a tax system for me to pay tax, and you've designed it in such a way that I can escape it, everybody will take advantage of it yeah. because we live in the political environment where people also want to tell you that what you are doing is wrong. It's so they'll take yeah. advantage of that. So there's no need for that official statement coming from the ministry telling us that it is a political party that has bad people to go and cause that behavior. Mm -hmm. You could have averted it by designing a system to reduce that effect so that people do not take advantage of it. But that notwithstanding, we cannot just say that this is a policy that is bad. Mm -hmm. Just as he mentioned that 60% of it is, is something that they've done. Then again, we also have to come back to the issue of data. All For right. the first time in the history of this country, we can boldly say that we know the number of children who are in the secondary schools on the average, mm -hmm. which would help us to do proper planning in terms of how we want to expand our tertiary institutions, what government want to do in terms of budget allocations and all that. And accountability can be demanded in the process. So we have that. And then again, you look at the issue of the, the number of children who have gained admission to secondary school. Yeah. Now we have reduced the number drastically 
those who could not go, go to secondary school those mm. days, now they've reduced the number drastically, which for me, it's, it's very critical because at least you are sure that this X number of children are in school. Even if they are not getting quality education? Even if they are not getting quality. That's why we are talking about the, 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 the access that we've given to them. Okay. However, that also helps you to do the plan in terms of the quality that we want to ensure in the process. Mm -hmm. And that for me, it has taken a long time for government to say that, yes, yeah, this is the agenda that we want to pursue to ensure that those who we have enrolled in school, these are the things that we are going to do for them. Okay. Because it comes back to the issue of you leaving, somebody going for 41 days, others going for 45 to 48 days, mm -hmm. and they come and stay home for a number of days without any mechanism to check on them as to what they are doing at home. Because this is a policy that has a combination of economic and social. So if you are dealing with the economic side by paying fees for the student, then the state must also be interested in ensuring that the social environment is protected yeah. because you are making investment. How do you ensure that the investment that you are making to the lives of our children are protected? Mm -hmm. There are records of children who, within that period, get pregnant. There are records. They are there. There are records that these children go to do certain activities, like using all kinds of forms to engage in drug menace and all that. So these are things that the state might put because we are investing. These are things that we want to see. But again, it comes back to the issue of how government wants to approach it. Yeah. And what they really want to do in the process of making sure that the investment that they are making to the lives of our children uh, yield the kind of result that we want to see. Is this, is this policy sustainable? And I'm talking about funding because we all know that, you know, uh, government is uh, taking some chunk of money from our oil revenues to sustain um, free SHS. But I know CSOs have complained about the fact that we need to find alternative sources of funding. Um, which which alternatives are you, uh, you know, touting for? And if that should happen, or if that shouldn't happen, will free SHS be sustainable? Of course. We should, for, for the free SHS, from my point of view, I think that we should sustain it. Because once you have introduced a social policy, it will be very difficult to go back and say that you don't want to implement it. Uh -huh. But there are, there are systems that government can use to engage that process. Okay. One is to ensure that whatever investment that you make, you know, you, you, are, you account for it, uh -huh. and then you ensure that there's no wastage in the process. Then again, there are, there are certain scholarships that existed in the past where government, as a result of this, government has collapsed those uh, scholarships, which I thought that those scholarships could still exist mm -hmm. and then do what they are supposed to do, but on behalf of the state, so that it takes away a certain number of children from the shoulders of government okay. by they taking care of these uh, people, which government failed to do that. And you also remember that the Minister of uh, Finance made, a, st made a, a, a statement to Parliament that they are going to set up a fund where the private sector would contribute to it mm -hmm. in terms of how they want to sustain it. These are things that still we've not seen the reality of it. How they are going to do it, we don't know. But again, it comes back to we putting a lot of pressure on government uh, 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 pocket in terms of how they finance it. And that is where the issue is. But my concern is the little resource that we, ha we are investing, how are we ensuring uh, 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 accountability and how people okay. uh, will let use me, it? Let me Cookie come to the issue of financial sustainability. It's at the core of the success of the program. Yeah. Now, I believe that even though in social policy, I believe that targeting is very, very important mm. because if you really want to ensure value for money, judicious resources, you need to ensure that interventions go directly to those who really need them. Mm -hmm. However, the approach we have adopted in financing the free senior high school is to increase taxes on parents. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so it makes it difficult for me to say that let's target the policy. Because the parents themselves are paying more mm -hmm. for that. They have paid the free screening fees by paying CST, paying new income taxes, and other new taxes on petroleum and other, other um, indirect taxes, yeah. which the excuse or the reason give, be, given by government was that you are paying more because we need money to fund the freezing high school. Yeah. And so I don't subscribe to the target when it comes to the freezing high school. I want to go with the right perspective, okay. where we say that education is a right and that rights are inalienable, everybody must assess it, and mm -hmm. for that matter, the government must fund it. Now, let's not forget that currently, in, in this year's budget, about out of our 83 billion cities, about 12 billion is going into education. 
and 2.4 billion is going to fund the first mm -hmm. high school. We are currently doing about 15% in terms of budgetary allocation. I mean, percentage of education budget to the national key. It's about 15%. You understand? Mm -hmm. We are still below the AU's benchmark of about 20%. Wow. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so, um, I always struggle to place issues relating to financial sustainability of the free senior school within context. I know that there are other um, interventions of government in the free senior school policy that are non-budgetary, yeah. like the expansion of infrastructure, which is under the Get Fund Securitized Loan. That one is not budget, it's non budgetary. But what I want to see is that until we get to the point where we are committing 20% of our budget into education, mm -hmm. um, I don't think that the issue of so financial stability should come in. Okay. I think what should come in is what Bright probably mentioned, that we should rather look at how judicious we are, we are using the current resources, right. okay? Planning efficiently to ensure that there is value for money mm -hmm. and not using our money to buy past questions because we are staggering um, to, to ensure that everybody passes. But because we are discussing the manifesto, mm -hmm. there's one thing we can never discuss. We can never forget um, discussing. It is the quality ingredient of what makes the free senior high school a good policy, what makes basic education good, what makes the teacher a good teacher, yeah. and what makes it in a learning progressive. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was a very, very critical um, promise in the manifesto which said that government to provide free Wi-Fi in all secondary schools and tertiary yeah. schools. And that policy, that, that, that promise was made in respect of improving the quality of teaching and learning and research mm -hmm. in schools. Yeah. Now, we, are, we are appreciate the fact that when a teacher has access to Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi for that matter, yeah. the teacher's capacity to undertake research is enhanced without even getting any research grant. Same for administrative purposes, as mentioned in the manifesto. In, under the ICT in schools too, it also mentioned that there, there's going to be a program rolled out from the junior high school level to ensure that our students uh, are ICT literate. Yeah. As we speak now, even at the senior high school level, less than 30% of students are examined in ICT. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. what, I mean, what I mean is that everybody's examined in mass, in, in English. English okay? yeah. But when it comes to ICT, less than 30%. And if you look at the number of schools even doing ICT in junior high schools, yeah. it's very minimal because there are no facilities. And so we are nowhere near upgrading the capacity of our students at the junior high school level to even appreciate ICT. Much more talk about providing ICT facilities even at the senior high school level to ensure that they are literate and also teachers have Wi-Fi to undertake research. I don't see the Wi-Fi. So in the would school. you rather we strengthen the junior high schools before even focusing on SHS? I see, obviously, obviously, um, there are two schools of thought. One school of thought believes that we can't wait forever. The mm -hmm. time is now, OK? Mm -hmm. And another school of thought is, says that let's build them build blocks first, and then we pursue it progressively. Okay. It's like our approach to independence, right? Which yeah. school of thought do you belong to? I, I, I mentioned earlier that I fall in between because I believe that because we are subscribed to SDG 4, 4.1 says that ensure, I think 4.1, yeah, ensure that every child in your country has access to pre-basic, basic, secondary, and TVET. Uh -huh. And so once the state has acceded yeah. to the SDGs, there must be an affirmative action to ensure that every child of school go in it, from pre-basic to secondary yeah. is in school. And so we may not wait for every critical building block to be in place okay. before we make a move towards universal secondary education. All right. My time is up. Let me quickly ask uh, this, and then we can go. So if you are to look at the manifesto and the promises that have been made and you are to score government so far, what score would you give them? <laughs> for, for scores, it would be... And it's not just very, for the SHS, very, because he gave the score for yeah, the for, SHS, for, but overall... For, for scores, it would be very difficult for me because I strongly believe that a lot of things that you've promised in the manifesto on the ground is not really what is happening in the education sector. There have okay. been a lot of changes. For instance, the double track wasn't part of the... Uh, what do we call it? The, the, the manifesto. The manifesto. It yeah. was a need they, yeah. that they have to address. So clearly, if I want, really want to measure them by what they have provided in their manifesto, mm -hmm. it will be very difficult. But I would rather would prefer to measure it based on what is on the ground. 
okay. which I would say that between 60 to 70 percent, I should be able to give to them in the education sector. Okay, so you are 60, 70. That's not exactly. a bad mark at yeah. all. That's be, um, you know, above half mark. Exactly. So, so far, so good for you. So far, so good. Okay, and what about you, Kofi? I, we, Africa Education Watch is, is um, we have commissioned a research. We are evaluating the implementation of all the education promises that, that was made in the manifesto. And um, we are going to publish um, our findings sometime in, in March. Okay. But, um, so, um, I don't want to make any preemptive statements here. But in respect of the freezing high school, that should give them I, I had participated <laughs> in a research that actually evaluated it in its first year or second year. I have, a, I have the luxury of, you know, opining that at least six over ten. Yeah. I mean, the best I can give right. is six over ten okay. because of the the, the, the the deficits in planning All right. um, for the policy. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's still more to discuss on the manifesto um, in terms of education, but so far, so good. We've had in the studios Bright up here. He is an advocate for child rights, and also Kofi Asari is the executive director for Africa Education Watch. Thank you so much for joining me.